chapter 3, what is not predator is prey. We have to run back through the door, Kamari said, grabbing Akaru's shoulder. There will be no running, said William, as he stepped in the way of the only exit. While the silence lingered and the stillness continued, the ground beneath them trembled and liquefied into flowing darkness. Before either could look fret about it, all four started sinking into the floor. Come on, Kamari yelled, and before Hikaru knew it, they were all falling once again into a void of darkness. Hikaru felt his body falling through the air, but continued to grip Amber's hand tightly as they swished through nothingness until finally, he landed in the dirt on his back. Amber lay on her shoulder to his left while Kamari skillfully landed to his right. Wonder where we are, he pondered, looking toward the tropical surroundings. Hikaru and Amber stood up, then peered around to figure out their location. Looking at the beautiful diversity of plants, Hikaru presumed that they had landed inside a rainforest. Maybe we're in the Amazon, he answered, still carefully browsing the area. Seeing how frightened Amber was, Kamari grabbed her hand. Don't worry, we'll do our best to protect you, he said with assurance. Kamari browsed through the tropic green plant life, but saw no sign of the large man who had pursued them. He listened carefully as the sound of multicolored birds chirped filling the area. Exotic hummingbirds fed from the nectars of red flowers from afar, then, without reason, flew off into the distance. The sound of every forest creature fleeing through the brushes triggered Kamari's alertness. He shoved Amber's hand into Akaru's. Our enemy's coming. Suddenly, Kamari yanked Hikaru by the arm. Run! Hikaru saw him through the brushes. It was William Hunter coming toward them at full speed chopping down any limbs in the way of his destination with his gigantic sword. The three of them raced away, weaving between every tree with Kamari trailing by a few feet. While running desperately, Hikaru heard the soft wind whisper once again. The only limitation is set toward imagination. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Hikaru shouted back at the top of his lungs. That's it, said Kamari. He came to a halt. Hikaru stopped also holding Amber's hand as he looked back. What are you doing? He screamed. You can't run forever, Kamari said. He closed his hand loosely, and inside his left palm appeared a Japanese katana. Hikaru gazed in astonishment. How? He attempted to ask, still breathing heavily while his body raced with adrenaline. William Hunter came to a halt as he caught up and saw the sword Kamari had manifested. So, my prayers learned enough to defend itself. It doesn't matter how many weapons you create, I, William Hunter, will still be victorious because I am the Predator. The three teens all stared with wide eyes in utter shock, and there was an awkward pause. You really get a kick out of this, don't you, Kamari said. He tightened both hands around the hilt of the katana, then charged forward at full speed. William swung his gigantic sword across, aiming for Kamari's throat, but Kamari dodged it by ducking catching balance with his off hand and running to the man's left, getting behind the hunter. Before William could carry his heavy sword to turn around, Kamari raised his blade overhead, slicing the large pursuer once on the back. The sharp end of the sword cut through the metal suit, leaving a large gash. Shit, Kamari sighed lowly. It didn't cut through. He slowly backed ten feet away from his opponent. Huh, it'll take more than that to pierce my armor, boy, the hunter arrogantly pointed out while grinning. Fearful that Kamari was in danger, Hikaru focused his hardest to create a sword inside his palm also, but nothing appeared. He couldn't feel the slightest tingle of supernatural energy, coming to the realization that it was impossible for him to materialize a weapon, Hikaru jolted forward in desperation to enter the fight. And as he did so, a katana appeared inside his tightly closed right fist, slightly opening his hand while it formed. Kamari took a quick side glance at Hikaru, who was approaching to stand by his side. Stay back, Kamari yelled. No, I have a plan, Hikaru shouted. He quickly made space between himself and Kamari. As Hikaru stood several feet to Kamari's left, ideas triggered inside his mind. He thought about there being cracks in every type of armor. Kamari glanced at him awkwardly and both understood that they could hear the other's thoughts. You rats ready to die, the hunter said impatiently. Kamari materialized a throwing knife inside his right hand and held it up beside his katana for William to spot. He thought vividly, Hikaru, I'll distract him while you carry out your plan. And with that, Hikaru understood that they were carrying out their tactics through telepathic communication. Kamari charged toward the hunter's left and Hikaru raced in from the right. 
Kamari quickly closed in on their enemy, then Kamari pitched the throwing knife at the hunter's neck, forcing the right-handed swordsman to block from his left side with a swing of his gigantic sword. After spotting the opening, Kakaru punched his katana into the joint of the hunter's right arm and quickly moved out of the way. Then Kamari instantly followed up, slicing near the joint where Akaru had punched his sword, cutting the hunter's right forearm completely off. He crouched low afterwards, and as the hunter spun around wildly, clutching his severed arm, Kamari seized the chance, then used his blade to slice through the joint of the hunter's right knee, almost cutting completely through it. After the final assault, he ran toward Akaru as the colossal giant fell onto the ground. We got him, Kamari yelled out, his adrenaline pumping as William stiffened. Akaru couldn't help but feel relieved as he watched the hunter lay on the ground, his blood soaking the soil. Although he did harbor some compassion, there was no doubt in his mind. They had had no choice other than to fight ruthlessly. Amber raced to Akaru's arm, clutching it tightly while staring away from the hunter. How do we get out of here? Akaru mentioned, still a little panicky after the risky fight. Remember what the wind said, our limit is our imagination, replied Kamari. Yeah, that really explains how we're supposed to leave, Akaru said frustratedly. Calm down. All we have to do is imagine a portal back home, Kamari said. He raised his arm to make a passage, but nothing appeared. Oh crap, now we're never going to get back home, Akaru mumbled, scratching his head in disbelief. We can't make our way out of here. Kamari stared at the palm of his right hand, dropping his bloody sword. I don't understand why we can't leave. I made a sink last time. Hearing a faint sound of moaning, Akaru turned around and placed his eyes on the fallen man, watching the hunter as he arose on all fours. Akaru's heart began racing as he witnessed strange happenings. Amber clutched onto Akaru's arm even tighter, then unleashed a blood-curdling scream. Strange things are afoot. Find out what happens in the next chapter. I'm not going to give you a spoiler alert. That's not really what it's called.